So without further ado, please put your hands together and welcome our first speaker for this evening, uh, who is here, obviously. Uh, please give it up for uh, Andy Gell. <laughs> The Chief Invasion Officer uh, of iProperty.com. So he has a lot hanging on the line in terms of like how he presents tonight. So no pressure, right? Yeah. So okay. Okay. Look at that. Do you know how you do that actually? Is that you? That's you, right? Is that you? That's um, pink bubble gum and peanuts. Do you want to do rocks and teeth? Pink bubble gum and teeth. So I'm going to set your slides up uh, and then you, you do the sacred. It's Halloween, man. You, you made it so easy for me. Mm. Thanks for that. And that was 10 years ago, by the way, just in case you were wondering. You look better. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm rocking the V-neck tonight I'm, I'm on the behest of the Malaysian education. List. <laughs> there you go, bro. Well, you got laser and oil and back. Laser. You got to point to the lead with the finger. <laughs> point the laser. It, it should work. No, not, not at me. Uh, give it up for uh, Andy Kelp. Um, so I'm, I'm nothing to do with these guys, just up front, so in case anyone wonders why I'm talking about them, I'm not getting paid to, um, they probably should, so um, when, when the replay of this goes and I'll send it to AWS, I'll be demanding my fee. Um, so I, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, Amazon Web Services, what it is, why it is, why you might want to use it. Um, before I start, does anyone use AWS? You. Does everyone else know what it is? Some? Uh, so a AWS Amazon Web Services started um, uh, about 10 years ago, actually. Uh, 2002, uh, Amazon Web Services first started, but their first publicly accessible web service uh, was called Simple Storage Service. They released that in 2006. Uh, soon followed that with some others uh, around 2006. So, you know, it's been going for six years. It's been around for quite a while. But it's only, I guess, in the last probably two, three years that it's really started to take off and, and, and achieve critical mass. Um, number one cloud service provider in the world. Uh, estimated earlier this year they have around 450,000 servers which power their infrastructure. Um, and there's a whole range of things that they do. Um, and I also um, want to talk about how we're using Amazon Web Services and, and our experience with it. <coughs> uh, so a bit of background about us. Um, we, we run some websites which have lots of people visiting them. Um, and we run those currently off a bunch of servers uh, which are hosted here in KL up the road. Um, and we're starting to move services over to Amazon. Uh, and there's a few reasons for that. One is uh, cost, one is flexibility. There's, there's various reasons we've decided to go down that path. Um, so our first foray into Amazon Web Services um, was probably about a year ago. We, we started looking at Simple Storage Service. Uh, so for those who don't know, Simple Storage Service is basically a big disk somewhere in the internet which you can store stuff on. Uh, you can also deliver content from there. <coughs> So for our business, we have um, property classifieds. We have lots of images that we serve up of, of houses and condos and offices and the like. And that, that set of images is growing all the time. So for us, uh, we were storing those on a, on a NetApp, a network disk. And we found that we were starting to run out of space. So we had two choices, really. One was that we buy more, more, more disk shelves. Uh, the other is that we look at alternative storage options. Um, the problem with buying disk shells is that you buy them in multiples of terabytes. So if you've got a few terabytes of images and you're starting to run out of space, then you need to buy a few more terabytes, which is great. It means that in two years, three years' time, you'll still have lots of space. But it also means that you're paying for something which you're not using. So your demand curve is very, very lumpy. Your, problem, your demand curve is smooth, but your supply curve is very lumpy. And you end up with a problem of either undersupply because you haven't grown capacity fast enough, or oversupply because you've bought the capacity and you're not using it. So for us, S3 was um, a way that we could move all those images out, keep them in fairly cheap storage, and actually deliver them directly to clients. 
So we use that S3 for delivering static content. Um, we actually serve a lot of our uh, CSS and JavaScript through S3. And in front of that, we're using um, CloudFront, which is Amazon's CDN service. Uh, so they've got various servers all over the world where they're serving out content. Uh, for us in this region, Hong Kong and um, Singapore are the two closest ones. So we actually get to serve our images through that, and it's very, very cost effective. Uh, and I won't give you the, the raw numbers, but it's probably fair to say that when we compare it to our other CDM, which we use with Akamai, it's significantly cheaper. Um, and one of the other advantages we've found with CloudFront is also streaming video. Um, and streaming video is, uh, particularly in the property industry, something which is starting a lot of agents and developers are really wanting to um, provide video content. Um, for us, streaming that through Amazon is easy because they've got uh, the, the, the various streaming servers already there, ready to go. You just upload the file and point it at it. Um, it's also cheap because you're using, the bandwidth you're using is the bandwidth that you pay for. So typically bandwidth, if you're, if you're hosting with uh, traditional providers, you pay for a pipe. So if you're using 10% of that pipe, it doesn't matter, you're still paying for 100% of it. Whereas here with AWS, if we do one gigabyte of data transfer, we pay for one gigabyte. So particularly for streaming, when you're not doing it all the time, if you're doing it in bits and pieces, it's actually very cost effective to do it through, um, through AWS. So that was our first kind of foray into Amazon Web Services was, was I guess, the easy stuff. Um, and, and S3 really is, it's very easy. Um, you can, there's various command line tools, browser-based tools, desktop tools for getting the stuff up there and then it's just pointing the URL and, and it's, it's really that simple. The next kind of place we decided to start doing, um, to use uh, AWS was on some of our commodity services. And for me, commodity services are those things which just you need to do, but they don't really add any value to your business. You've just got to get them done. So the classic one to me about is DNS. So when, when, we, when I first started our property, we were, we were hosting our own DNS service, and that was painful. Um, it's really not something I want people to, you know, my team to be doing. Um, so we moved it over to uh, Ultra, uh, who are a fantastic provider, got lots of good things to say about Ultra. Uh, but then Amazon came into the picture and said, hey, we're doing DNS now. Come and have a look at this. We're charging 50 cents for a zone. Right. Oh, interesting. Um, so I did some maths the other day. And yeah, I mean, Route 53 costs us about 53%. Uh, sorry, 53? 5% the cost of Ultra for the same service. So again, a bit of a no-brainer. Um, but we, we move a lot of our DNS over there. Um, and the other really nice service, which is I class as kind of a commodity, is uh, email sending. So we send a lot of emails. Um, anyone who's a subscriber to iProperty probably realizes we send a lot of emails. Um, sorry, nothing I can do about it. Um, but we use uh, SES, uh, Simple Email Service, um, for some of our sites. The reason we do it, it's easy. You don't need to code for it. Um, you can use their APIs for it, but you can just treat it as a SMTP host and send stuff through it. And you don't need to worry about the deliverability of it. That's all managed by Amazon for you. If you're running your own mail server, you need to get a lot of things right about the first DNS, about um, what, what ports are open, and all sorts of things to stop, the, stop your mail server getting blacklisted. With SES, no need to worry. It just gets done. So after the commodity, we then started to move into, I guess, more of the meat and potatoes of what Amazon does. And, and EC2 is really, I guess, the, 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 the base unit of a, lot of a lot of the additional services that Amazon offer. Um, EC2 is, is essentially a virtual machine in the cloud. Um, and the reason that EC2 for me is, is a real plus is that you've got, um, Instances there which uh, they come and go whenever you want them. So you don't have to spend that time managing the hardware. Um, and there's some really good stories which, um, if you ever get the chance to listen to a guy called Werner Vogels, who is uh, Dutch, he's the CTO of Amazon, 
He tells a really nice story about um, a brewery in Belgium around the turn of the 20th century. And this brewery, they, they had a bunch of people working there, 12 people, who were just running electricity generators so that the brewery could do its business. And this is before the time that, that you know, mains electricity was readily available. So they had to employ people just to make electricity to, so they could uh, brew beer. So as soon as the, the utility companies came along and said, hey, we can plug you into the mains and you don't need to run your own generators anymore, they jumped at the chance. These 12 people who were previously generating electricity could now go and brew beer instead and actually add value to the business. So this is, this is really where, where computing is starting to go, is, is, is becoming a utility. Um, I don't want to employ people who sit there managing servers, worrying about networking, worrying about replacing disks. I'd much rather do that at the scale that Amazon does that, have them do it for me. What it does mean, though, is that you're operating at a different level of abstraction. So instead of worrying about hardware and, oh no, the, the machine's gone down, we better replace the motherboard, we better replace the power supply, whatever it is, you're worrying about a different level of, of, of the system, and you have no access to that. So a machine goes down, you really have no idea why it's gone down. So you have to think in a different way. You have to assume that your instance is fragile, and you have to be able to recover from that. So instead of debugging an instance when it crashes, your default recovery is to spin up a new one and get on your way. Don't worry about the dead one, just turn it off. You, don't, you stop paying for it, start a new one. So what it does mean is that you need um, you need automation you need to be able to uh, rapidly rebuild your environment um, and, and be able to cope with that. Because if, you, if, you're, if you're treating it like a standard server where you assume it's always going to be there, you're going to be in trouble because eventually it will disappear whether you want it to or not. So you get the benefits um, of, of not having to manage the hardware, but you also have to start to, to change your perceptions of, of what you're dealing with. Um, and one of the other services we've found very, very useful um, is laser pointer. Um, RDS, which is basically another level abstracted from that. So RDS stands for Relational Database Service. So you can run MySQL, you can run Oracle, you can run SQL Server. And you don't have to worry about installing an operating system, installing packages, anything like that. It's just a service that you use. So if you're a web developer, you're writing in PHP, you want to connect to a database, you don't have to worry about setting that database up. You just fill in, some, fill in a form and any database appears. And again, it means that you end up sacrificing some level of, level of control for the flexibility and the benefits of, of not having to do it. So it's another level of abstraction built on top of, of EC2. So right now, we're running uh, one of our primary sites uh, on EC2 and RDS. We're about to migrate uh, a few more. They're, they're just in testing at the moment. Um, and you can run Linux on there, you can run Windows. So most of our sites are kind of a mix of Windows and Linux. So for us, it's, it's, a, it's a great environment for running our sites. Um, and then in, 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 in recent years, I guess Amazon has started to really build on top of this basic kind of unit of, of EC2 that's been around for about six years. And they started to add a lot of interesting things which um, allow teams to really, um, again, forget about the infrastructure as such and move more towards the platform. So things like CloudFormation, which allow you to define a set of services and to repeatedly and reliably bring those services up whenever you want it to. Um, using auto-scaling for EC2, which uh, means that you can have a set of web servers, for example, and once those web servers uh, start to reach capacity, you just add an auto uh, a new one automatically. So again, this relies on you having an automated way to, to rebuild your environment. But it does mean that if you suddenly get a peak, that you can add more web servers automatically without anyone getting involved. And then from, from there, they've really started to build also true platform as a service um, services, if that makes sense. Uh, they've got Elastic Beanstalk. So if you're running Python, PHP, .NET, or um, Java with Comcat, you can use Elastic Beanstalk. You just build your application. You put it into Git. You tell Elastic Beanstalk where your Git repository is, and uh, it starts running. 
And, and that's a service which they offer basically for free. You pay for the, uh, the infrastructure for the EC2 instances, but everything else uh, is it's just an, ad, uh, an added extra that, that you, you get for free. So these are areas which we're kind of in the moment of investigating, I guess. We're, we're looking at those as, as something which we'll do in the future. Auto scaling actually we've just turned on for one of our um, sites in the last couple of weeks. Um, but the other two we're, we're kind of in, in investigation stages of at the moment. Um, and there's various other kind of tools. Um, I, 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 I would run far over my 15 minutes if I went through every single tool. Um, you can do caching, which is compatible with Memcache. You can do um, a full text search, which is using the same engine as Amazon's A9. Um, and DynamoDB, which is a really nice uh, NoSQL data store, which actually runs on solid state drives and is super, super fast. Um, we're not using any of these at the moment. We're definitely going to use ElastiCache. And I'm happy with that because it, it just looks like Memcache. And you can move somewhere else and use the same code. These two I'm a little more cautious on. And the reason for that is, um, I guess you end up with the potential of vendor lock-in. If you're using an, a, an API such as Cloud Search, which only exists in AWS, you're locking yourself into AWS. So that's a potential um, area to be cautious of, I think, <clears> when, when, you, when you're looking at these kinds of services. Um, and I think right on about 15 minutes, that's about it. Um, the thing I'd like to mention is we have an AWS user group. Uh, it's on Facebook, and you can find the address there. Um, <laughs> how's that for timing? Um, and we have a meetup this Saturday, actually, at 10 o'clock um, over at iTrain. I think we're co-going with the Python group. Um, we've got a guy called Joe Ziegler coming along who is uh, Amazon's AWS evangelist for the, for the region. He's a fantastic speaker, just come back from Bangalore where he was at the AWS summit. Um, he's, he's much better at speaking than I am, so um, I would suggest going down there and hearing from him if you want to find out more about AWS. Um, alternatively, grab me, um, I think at the beginning I have my Twitter thing, possibly. Yeah, there you go. You can tweet me or um, andy at iproperty.com or just come and grab me after whatever. Um, that's it. Awesome. Thank you.